Hello everyone, this is Onia. In this video, I am going to be discussing a very controversial idea that I have. It's, I've studied in depth the differences between the Gospels. Now, when uh, I was a Christian, well, excuse me, I still am a Christian, but when, when I was a standard Christian from the Protestant upbringing, I was taught to believe that the Bible was perfect and nothing was wrong with it at all, no errors in it. And so whenever I found contradictions in the Gospels, I ignored them, or I explained them away to say, no, that was, those aren't contradictions, there's a way to make it work. The fact is, there's always a way to force it to fit. If you want to, do, to deny a conclusion that you do not that you're not comfortable with. There's always a way to, to dismiss it. If we're honest with ourselves and honest with the evidence and data, then there's only one conclusion we can logically come to, and that is that the Gospels in their current form are very corrupt, at least some of them, and that the original version of the Gospels had to be substantially different for at least one of the Gospels, and here's why. Uh, in particular, for the most part, Gospel of John is not too big of an issue, although there's some inconsistencies there as well. But because the Gospel of John so very little overlaps in content and ideas, sayings with, with the other Gospels, that one we don't need to consider too much, but it's the synoptic Gospels, or the three Gospels that are so similar to each other, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those Gospels are the ones that give us a major problem. And when, when people see these contradictions or inconsistencies, more often than not, they're going to tell you that the Gospel of Matthew is the more is the superior version to the other Gospels. They'll say Mark and Luke are Roman, they're more Gentile-ish, they're less Hebraic, but when you start actually looking at the evidence, it appears to be the exact opposite. What it appears to be the case is that the Gospel of Matthew is more corrupt in a significant degree than Mark and Luke. Luke features some Hebraisms in an amazing way that Matthew does not. Uh, I, re I read some top scholar who translated Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke into Hebrew um, from the Greek, I believe. He noted that when he was doing the translation, Matthew and Mark were highly difficult to translate into Hebrew, but when he was translating Luke, it was very easy to translate it into Hebrew. That was his own observation, and that was a a top, you know, it, that wasn't just some random amateur scholar, but it was a a credible scholar who knew who knows Hebrew and is well learned in that language. So, when I started comparing these Gospels, I noticed some major contradictions that just could not be reconciled. And what I noticed is that, generally speaking, Mark and Luke agree, or Luke agrees with another witness against the Gospel of Matthew. More often than not, it is that Matthew is the odd one out. You've got some major problems with some stuff in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, in particular, there's the interesting phenomenon that in ver very often in the Gospel of Matthew, two of something is mentioned, whereas in Mark and Luke, it's only one. So, in Matthew, two blind men are healed. In Mark and Luke, in that same story, it's just one man. Uh, there's plenty of other examples where it's two in Matthew, one in Mark and Luke. Mark and or Luke. Uh, you got Matthew, which has two animals. It has it has the donkey and the colt. Two, but in 
Luke, it's a single animal. It's a cult. Just a single animal, not two different ones. So Matthew has uh, altered that. Then we've got Matthew's uh, genealogy, which claims that there's 42 generations in this genealogy that it provides, but in almost all our manuscripts, we only see 41 generations, not 42. So a major hole in the Gospel of Matthew, that pretty much all manuscripts are have that corruption in it, showing that this the corruptions for the Gospel of Matthew had to have occurred significantly early, at an early period. What we notice is that the Gospel of Matthew presents in various places a watered-down gospel, a gospel which suppresses certain ideas. I guess an example. In the Gospel of Luke, when the Messiah speaks to uh, when Messiah is talking with his disciples and the disciples ask questions uh, about po the, po the, the rich, he tells us that he tells the rich man who says he's kept the commandments, he says, if you want to be perfect, go, go sell all that you have. That's in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, it doesn't say go sell all that you have. It just says go sell what you have. An example of so the all is removed to make it seem less harsh and less extreme of of a command. Um, you've also got the interesting uh, exception clause in the Gospel of Matthew, and not all manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew have this exception clause, but a large number of them do, where it basically says. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another, except for adultery. Except for fornication, it says. Except for fornication. It sounds like it's implying that, oh, if, if, they, if your wife committed adultery, or if your husband committed adultery, it's okay to divorce and remarry. It's so fine. However, in the Gospel of Mark and Luke, there is no exception clause. It says in Mark and Luke number, multiple times, whoever do, divorces his spouse and marries another commits adultery. Flat out, there is no exception clause. We see in the Shepherd of Hermas, there is no exception clause. And the Shepherd of Hermas was a very ancient document. The written in the latter portion of the first century by a man named Hermas, who was a companion of Clement of Rome. And Clement of Rome was the chief successor and disciple of the Apostle Peter. So we've got Clement endorsing and authenticating, authenticating the Shepherd of Hermas, and the vast majority of the early church considered the Shepherd of Hermas either to be scripture or at the very least authoritative on matters of moral issues. They all regarded it as a highly valuable document that every that new believers absolutely need to be acquainted with. This was the consensus of the early church. Irenaeus, Oregon, and other early church fathers refer to the Shepherd of Hermas as scripture. At any rate, in the Shepherd of Hermas, it explicitly specifies that you are not allowed to remarry after you divorce your spouse, even if they commit adultery. If you remarry after they commit adultery, you have yourself committed adultery, according to the Shepherd of Hermas. And that's the same teaching we see in the Gospel of Mark and Luke. But that's not the teaching in the Gospel of Matthew. So we see that our copies of Matthew have been polluted. One second.
Okay, I'm back. My apologies. Uh, so they've been polluted. So now with that out of the way, we're going to go now to one passage in particular, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. And we're not going to go through the whole sermon. We're just going to go through one section, the very beginning section, and comparing the accounts with Matthew and Luke. And we're going to see that the accounts presented are radically contradictory. So, and that Luke's gospel presents the superior one because it's more difficult of a, of a teaching. And it's more in line with the Messiah's harsh teaching of forsaking sin and, and purifying yourself. So, and it also is in line more with the Essene ideas, the Essene, the Essene teachings of the Dead Sea Schools. So with that said, uh, bo both accounts start out with with the Messiah healing people and gathering his, disi his disciples gather to him. Now an interesting difference is in Matthew's Gospel, the twelve disciples have not yet been chosen. In Luke's Gospel, it appears that he had chosen his twelve disciples right before this sermon. Now, some people say that this is two different sermons. They try to argue that. However, there's not a strong case to make for that. The, the evidence is pretty strong that these are the same events and that there's just uh, differences in the two versions because it lines up so closely. It's highly improbable that they represent two different occasions. People who will say it's two different occasions say that because they have no other way to explain away the issues. Uh, but that's just an example of you can believe you can you can come up with any argument to try to defend your belief if you refuse to reject it. Uh, if you refuse to change your belief, you can you can use anything to justify it. But if it's a highly implausible idea, we should not be so quick to adhere to it because it makes us look foolish. If we're going to suggest that these are two different events, what's the more likely explanation? The more likely explanation is these are the same events, but that there's corruptions in one or both of the documents. So now I'm going to read here. Matthews says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke's Gospel says, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So notice the difference there. It, in Matthew, it's blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke is blessed are the poor. There's no in spirit there. That's a significant difference, which I will get to in a little bit. Next one is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is Matthew. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now we switch over to Luke's Gospel. Those were three uh, bless blessings, beatitudes. Luke only has two of those, and it has them in a different order. Luke has the hunger one first, and then the weeping, the mourning one after. So Luke's has, Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are those who weep now, for you shall laugh. Okay, now we continue. And Matthew has some Beatitudes, which are, have no parallel with the Gospel of Luke's sermon. And that's, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now let's look at Luke's account. It says, Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. And now, it continues in Luke with something that's not in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Uh, 
and it says, uh, so it says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe when men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Also, an interesting thing right there, woe when men speak well of you. In a few manuscripts, in some manuscripts it says, woe when all men speak well of you. But the majority of manuscripts don't say all men. It just says, woe when men speak well of you. So you've got, on the one hand, it, someone, sees a manu the, the, the bot, someone sees the Gospel of Luke say, woe when people speak well of you. And the guy's thinking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not always wrong. It's not always a bad thing if, if some men speak well of you. That must not be what it's saying. There must be an error. So let's add the word all to clarify to people so they understand it's okay if some men speak well of you. But when all men speak well of you, then you got to be careful. Then that's a woe. Well, that's silly because now... Now you've got you have it where you can justify oh well not every man was speaking well of me just a cup you know just the majority of men but they didn't all speak well of me so you see that all added there renders that warning renders it null and void it renders it obsolete it doesn't it's not a valid warning anymore when it's well, when men speak well of you, it's warning you. If a man speaks well of you, watch out. Be careful. Because they did the same to their fathers, the false prophets. Uh, I mean, excuse me, their fathers did that same to the false prophets. They spoke well of the false prophets. So when people speak well of you, beware. Whoa. Be careful. That's what it's saying there. Uh, now. Now we also uh, now to, to something very significant is every single time in the Gospel of Matthew, it consistently alters it to make it a more positive thing compared to Luke's account. In Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount, it is exclusively negative. It is exclusively it's exclusively bad stuff that you're being blessed for. In Matthew's account, you've got only good stuff that you're being blessed for. And no curses, no woes. There's no woes. Luke's account has the woes, the curses, and it, every blessing is twisted because it's blessed are you because this horrible thing is happening to you. But Matthew transforms it and alters it. It's no longer, in Matthew's account, it's no longer blessed when these horrible things happen to you. It's blessed when these good things happen to you. Good job. Because that's good, you'll be rewarded for what good things happen to you. Luke's account's not saying that. Luke's account's saying, if bad things happen to you, blessed are you. But if good things happen for you, whoa. So that's a, it's hard for people to understand that teaching, so they'll be prone to water it down and alter the message. And that's what we see Matthew's gospel has ultimately done. The scribes have corrupted the teaching of the Messiah. So, now, in Luke's account, we see the original message. It couples the blessings with the woes. It's parallelism here. So you cannot interpret the blessing separate from the woe. So when it says, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, you have to see what the woe is to understand what that blessing means. You look at the, you look at the woe and it says, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So, on the one hand, blessed are the poor. Four years of the kingdom of God. But, you know, blessed are the poor. People who are actually poor. Woe to you who are actually rich. For you have received your consolation. If you then look at the Matthew's account, it just says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now it's 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 transforming it from 
literal poverty to a humbleness, saying, blessed are the people who are humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's what it's saying. Uh, and then, blessed, uh, woe, if you, were, if you were to take the woe from Luke's and apply it to Matthew's, woe to those who are rich in spirit, uh, I guess it, it means that they're full of themselves. So that, that one at least, that one at least uh, sort of makes sense in Matthew. But when you think of poor in spirit, it makes you sound like you're spiritually poor. If you have spiritual poverty, that means you are a, you have a deficiency in righteousness. That's what it usually means. That's how we use it in modern times. We say, yeah, I'm rich. I, I'm rich in spirit. That's what we say. I'm rich in spirit, but I'm poor. I, I'm poor in physically, but I'm rich in spirit. That's what we'll, see, we'll hear people say. But if we were to believe Matthew, it's a bad thing to be rich in spirit. But it's good to be poor in spirit. But Luke's account doesn't even talk about in spirit, it's a blessed are the poor. Because it has nothing to do with spirit, but it has to do with actual poverty. And we see in other manuscripts, or in other writings of the apostles and prophets, Dead Sea Scrolls, we are told that basically communism is the way to live life. And we are not to live for ourselves. Private property is wrong, it's a sin. So if we hoard stuff for ourselves and don't share it with other people, we are rich in an evil sense. Now, if we are sharing everything we have with other people, we're no longer rich. Even though we have lots of money, we're not rich because we're not keeping it for ourselves. We're giving it all away, which is what, exactly what the Gospel says. Give everything away. If you receive, give it. So, don't keep it for yourself. Share it with others. So, now, it gets even crazier than this, though. Because now, we look, compare the two, you have, you have um, Luke's account. Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be filled. And then the woe. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Now let's see what Matthew says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? Luke's Gospel says, Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be filled, but woe to those who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Hold on a second. This is talking about literal hunger here. Whereas Matthew's Gospel is talking about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yeah, for righteousness. But if we apply the woe to Matthew's account, now it becomes blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But woe to those who are filled with righteousness, for they shall hunger and thirst for righteousness. It doesn't make sense. See, when you take Luke's account, compare it with Matthew, it contradicts itself. It makes it now into an absurd idea, where in Luke's account, those who are full now are bad, and they will hunger. Matthew's account, those who are full of righteousness now are good. It's not a bad thing. So it doesn't make sense there's no way to reconcile the two. That's a major contradiction. Matthew's account is talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Luke's account is clearly and unambiguously referring to hunger, literally, after food. Blessed are those who hunger, hunger after food. Now, we've also got, let's see here, 
Another interesting comparison here is it says in Luke's, Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Matthew's account says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Two things about that. First of all, say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Luke's account doesn't say falsely. You see, Matthew is consistently adding clarifiers to say, oh no, we don't mean this. We mean that we, you know, we have to add some words to clarify. That's not what we're talking about. So the word falsely is added in Matthew by some scribe because they don't want people to think, oh well, you know, if you if you have uh Sometimes it is acceptable to speak e evil against someone who deserves it. So, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So it's ex it's justifying saying evil against people if it's true. But if it's false, then it's bad. But Luke's account doesn't have that clarifier. It just says whether it's true or false. If someone speaks evil of you, it doesn't specify. It just says if they speak evil. Uh, it doesn't say... Uh, say all kinds of evil. It just says, cast out your name as evil. But it could be true, what they're saying. But uh, according to Luke's account, if someone's casting out your name as evil, they're, they're, you know, they're slandering you. And that's wrong. So blessed are you if someone slanders you. Um, but then, of course, actually, it does give the clarifier. It says, for the Son of Man's sake. So, obviously, they're not going to... You don't have to add the word falsely there. Because it's for the Son of Man's sake. So that word falsely in Matthew's account is unnecessary. And it shows that Matthew's account is secondary. <clears throat> also, what's interesting is Luke's account says, For the Son of Man's sake. Matthew's account says, For my sake. Some scribes probably thought here, hold on a second. In, in this account, it says, for the Son of Man's sake, it sounds like he's talking about someone else. We want to make sure people know that he's, he, he's not saying someone else is the Messiah. He's the Son of Man. So in, they changed it from Son of Man to my to make it clear that he's not talking about someone else. Luke's account preserves the original, even though it's a little bit confusing because he's referring to himself. So Luke's account actually can allow for some people to think, well, maybe he's referring... That's why people are confused if he's the Messiah or not. Tell us if you're the Messiah. Because he says, <clears throat> he refers to the Son of Man as if it's someone else other than himself. At other times, it seems like he's calling himself the Son of Man. So you can see how Luke's account shows why people were confused. Whereas Matthew account, Matthew's account kind of undermines that whole confusion that was going on. And as I said, uh, Matthew's account, it's completely expunged of negativity. Bad things. It's transformed into a positive thing. You know, blessed are the merciful. Well, that's a good thing. They shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's a good thing. It's not negative. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, blessed are the meek. But consistently, throughout Luke's version of the sermon, everything is bad. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Um, and Matthew adds that, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, And the in Matthew's account omits the woes, which is inexcusable. There's no way you can take the woes away. That changes the whole message without the woes. Now, what's interesting is we look at the Gospel of Thomas, which is a very ancient document. I believe it was written by the Apostle Thomas, and it is a third witness to some of the parables 
the sayings, the, the blessings, the attitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. There are three of them in the Gospel of Thomas that correspond. And they are as follows. Gospel of Thomas, saying 54, says, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Ah, look, the Gospel of Thomas agrees with Luke. It does not say the poor in spirit. It says the poor. Blessed are the poor. Then, saying 68, Jesus said, Blessed are you when you are hated and persecuted. Wherever you have been persecuted, they will find no place. Now, hold on. Luke's Gospel says, Blessed are you when men hate you. There's no hate mentioned in Matthew's, but there is in the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and saying 69, Jesus said, Blessed are they who have been persecuted within themselves. It is they who have truly come to know the Father. Blessed are the hungry, for the belly of him who desires will be filled. Again, Gospel of Thomas talking about hungry, literal food, the belly of him who desires. In other words, you know, it says out elsewhere in the Gospel of Thomas, you have to fast and keep the Sabbath to enter the kingdom. Although, you, so you have to, so we know from the scriptures that there are commandments to fast at certain times of the year. So, being hungry at times of fasting and not eating all kinds of food whenever you want in a exorbitant way, it shows uh, righteousness and humility. So, blessed are the hungry for the belly of him who desires will be filled. It's a those who suffer in this life will be rewarded in the next. And we know, we know from the uh, Luke chapter 16 has a parallel, or not a parallel, but a little bit of a clarifier in that teaching that he gave of the rich man and Lazarus, where Lazarus, uh, or the rich man, wants uh, mercy, and he's not given mercy. And then Abraham tells him why. He says, it says, Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. So what we basically see here is that the righteous receive evil things in this life, or bad things in this life, but they will be comforted. Whereas those who receive good things in this life, they will be tormented in the next life. That's Luke's message. That's so exactly Luke's message. And the Gospel of Thomas agrees in three in the three sayings of this correspondence, the only three sayings that have a parallel, all three of them have Thomas agreeing with Luke against against Matthew's account. So that's highly compelling. Highly significant. There's so many other issues with the Gospel of Matthew, but I'm going to leave it at that and end it, this video here. I hope you can see that this is clearly a major issue and throws Matthew's account of the Gospel into uncertainty. It makes it questionable in many ways because of how altered the message is. Oh, and there was one other example. Uh, there is a place where it says um, in the Gospel of Matthew, woe, I think it's Matthew, yeah. Woe to those, not woe, but it's like if you are angry with your brother without cause, that clause, without clause, is not in all manuscripts. It's added in the Gospel of Matthew to say, well, it's okay to be angry with your brother if he deserves it. But if if you don't have a just cause, then it's bad. So you see, we're adding to what the Messiah said to justify to what we believe is the case. So that's what scribes did. They added it to say it's wrong for those who who are angry with the brother without cause. But the Messiah didn't say without cause in the original teaching of it. He just said 
those uh, let, let me pull up the, the passage um, so I get it right yeah So it says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. But without a cause is not, is not in all manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew. So it suggests that someone added the word without a cause because... They felt it is appropriate sometimes to be angry with your brother. But notice that it does not say, if you're angry with your brother, you will be condemned. It doesn't say that. It says, you are in danger of judgment. So, being angry with someone is not a definite, you are going to receive judgment. But it makes you in danger. It's, it's a dangerous thing to be angry with your brother. So, if you're going to be angry with your brother, you've you got to be careful. That's what the message of Messiah is. It's not, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, then you're in danger. No. If you're angry with your brother with, without a cause, you're not just in danger of the judgment. You are going to be judged and condemned. If you are angry with your brother, period, whether it be without a, uh, with a cause or without a cause, it makes you in danger because it's possible you didn't have a cause. That's why you're in danger because you, you don't know necessarily if you had a, a valid cause or not. So be careful when you're angry with your brother because you're in danger of, of being condemned if you're in the wrong. But how we have the text right now, it's... But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger, implying that it's okay to be angry with your brother, and you might not be condemned for it. You're just in danger. No. According to the scripture, if you hate your brother in your heart, you're murdering in your heart, and if you, so if you hate your brother, you're not just in danger of condemnation. You are condemned. The scripture is very clear about that. So... Um, uh, now, it goes next, whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So, notice, in danger, in danger, in danger. It's not always wrong to call someone a fool. We know in scripture, the Messiah himself even calls people fools. And all throughout scripture we see foolish. Well, foolish and fool are the same, essentially. So, these words are not always wrong to use, but if you're going to use these words, if you're going to do these things, you're in danger if you do, because it's very, it's, it's risky, because if you're wrong, you're condemned for it. So, that's my take on that. Hopefully you enjoy the video. If you have any questions about this, please ask me, and... I do not want people to reject the Gospel of Matthew as scripture or authentic or authoritative. I believe it's scripture. I believe it's authoritative. I believe it's authentic. I simply believe that there have been alterations by the scribes to water down its message, to alter it, to make it agree closer to what they think the passage is saying. And I think they did it. They changed things out of a sincere attempt to be faithful to the truth, but that they altered it in a wrong way, unintentionally. But that, that's a major issue. But that we are to still to study the Gospel of Matthew as an authority, but we are to question what it says and test it to the other Gospels, the other evidence, and see what makes the most sense and try to restore the original version of Matthew the best as possibly we can. We are not to blindly follow what the Gospel of Matthew says, but we are to test what it says and remove the errors that are in it and restore it to its original purity as best as we can. That's the goal of what I'm trying to do, not just for the Gospel of Matthew, but for every book of the Scriptures, because every book of the Scripture is corrupt in varying degrees, some much worse than others. And Matthew is one of the more ones that are more highly corrupt than others, in my belief. I think there's a lot of evidence to support that idea. So I hope you found this video enlightening, 
and that it'll cause you to question and be more careful when you read the Gospel of Matthew. Salome to you, and may God bless you all.